Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. We're sitting on the couch today, so you can imagine that we are here for one reason and one reason only. We are here for a book haul. Uh, so I don't know why I wait until I have a literal stack of books so that I'm going to have to film a book haul for an hour. I really should probably do them more frequently than I do, but uh, let's just get into this. We're going to be here for a while. To get a weird one out of the way first, because I'm currently reading this, uh, I picked up Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I'm having some mixed emotions about it. I'm hoping that it picks up pace. It's a really, really long fantasy book uh, about vampires, as you might have guessed. And I think I'm probably going to wind up ultimately enjoying it, but it's taking a really long time to get into. I also picked up The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow, uh, which is a really, really fabulous historical fantasy. I have genuinely loved this. I'm also currently reading this and I'm about to finish it. I love her writing. I really just love Alex C. Hero's writing. Uh, and so this is one that is already a high recommend from me. It is set in the 1890s during the suffragist movement uh, around getting the vote for women. And so it's a really fascinating work uh, in many different ways. It's a great work of fantasy, but it's also, I think, very introspective and it causes you to think and reflect quite a bit on the time period that it's set in. I also picked up A Dowry of Blood by S.T. Gibson, uh, and this is a book about the Brides of Dracula. I have heard nothing but good things about it. It is apparently incredibly beautifully written, and it's very, very short, which I'm excited about, and maybe by the time you're seeing this, I will have read this, and I will have already told you how much I liked it or didn't like it. Uh, here's hoping that I do. I've heard just genuinely amazing things about this. I also picked up the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, and I am hoping that I really love this one. It seems like so many people do. Uh, people who are generally not into vampires, people who are generally not into horror, all seem to be picking this up and really loving it. This has apparently been a very, very popular book for Halloween this year, and so I'm hoping that I really, truly love this. I'm really excited to pick this one up. Last but not least of the kind of Halloween books that I picked up because I was really feeling spooky this year. I really wanted to read a lot of good horror books. I picked up The Death of Jane Lawrence by Caitlin Sterling. Oh my gosh. And I hated this. I hated it so much. I am definitely the odd one out here. It seems as though so many people have genuinely loved this and have been really obsessed with it uh, since it came out. So I definitely feel as though I'm at arm's length. But this book was not what I thought it was going to be, and I don't think it is what it's been marketed as. Uh, so I'll be interested to see how general opinion goes on this one. I think a lot of people picked it up this month when I'm filming it, and so I'll be interested to see everyone's wrap-ups and see whether anybody else felt similar to me. I picked up The Outcasts of Time by Ian Mortimer, and this is a really interesting book that involves time travel in a weird way. I think it starts out in 1348, the year of the plague, and then it kind of moves through the centuries, 99 years at a time. I don't know much about it. A lot of you guys have recommended it to me over the years, and so I'm just kind of taking a chance. I'm going in blind, and I'm not sure if I'm going to like it or not. I feel as though I've read something by Ian Mortimer before and I struggled with it, but maybe I'm wrong. If I did, it was in the years before I got on to Goodreads, and so I don't have record of it. But hopefully I will enjoy this one. I've seen a lot of people have really liked it. I also picked up Broken Harbor by Town of French. This is actually going to stand in for all six books in the Dublin Murder Squad series because I've picked up all of them and I didn't really want to go through all of them with you. I got them all used. They're all in various conditions, I will say. Once again, this just goes back to the never-ending fight and struggle that I have with thrift books. You never know what you're going to get with thrift books. Sometimes acceptable means the binding is barely on there. Uh, sometimes it means the book is almost new. And I can't really figure out the rhyme or reason to why they label things certain ways. Uh, because I imagine this was just good or acceptable and it looks incredible. 
But uh, this is actually the fourth book in the series, which is my next one. I have already read the first three and I have genuinely loved them. I am obsessed with her writing, so I expect to read the next three very, very soon. But speaking of Tana French, I also picked up The Witch Elm, which is one of her standalone thrillers, and this is what I'm talking about. So there's a lot of water damage here, and there was a lot of water damage to a couple of the other Dublin Murder Squad books. As you can see, it's just weird. It's just very unwieldy. I'm irritated too that apparently at Goodwill you could have gotten this for 99 cents and I'm sure I paid $3 for it because I don't believe that Thrift Books ever has anything below $3. So <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit ripped off right now. But this is one of her two standalone novels. I haven't picked up the other one yet because I saw enough about it that made me skeptical. But it seems as though readers have really enjoyed The Witch Elm. Uh, and so I'm hoping that I'm going to be somebody who also enjoys it because I have been genuinely obsessed with the Dublin Murder Squad books. And because I have been so into the Dublin Murder Squad books, I wondered if I was kind of getting into a thriller mood or if maybe now. I'm just a reader who really enjoys thrillers. I hope that's the case. Uh, I decided to pick up a thriller that I've heard quite a bit about and that I feel confident that I'm probably going to like, and that is The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell, if it'll stay closed. Uh, this has French flaps, which is incredible for a paperback. I love it. But this is, I think, kind of an inheritance type thriller where a girl inherits an apartment, but multiple other people are there. Uh, I really am not clear on the story here. I actually think she was found in the house and everyone else in the house was murdered when she was a child. Uh, so I think there's going to be a definite thriller aspect here, but I think there's also gonna be a bit of almost a knives out kind of underlying story here uh, about a bigger family, which I think is interesting. I am, I think, the odd man out, and I'm one of the few who didn't really care a thing for <laughs> Knives Out. I mean, it was okay, but I didn't think it was brilliant. Everyone acted like it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I didn't feel like that, but I feel as though it has spawned a lot of thrillers, and I'm more interested in the things it has spawned than I am interested in it. I think The Family Upstairs is kind of one of those, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm just really excited to try Lisa Jewell. A lot of people seem to like her, and hopefully I do too, but one thing I have to say that I've really loved about Tana French is that I've really loved her kind of more literary fiction style. There's a real lyrical quality to her writing. And so it's just a really beautiful book at the same time as being a really thrilling mystery. So I'm not really sure what Lisa Jewell has going on, but hopefully it will at least be a lot of fun. All right, so let's get into what I think most of you are likely here for, which are the classics. Uh, so I did take a massive bag of books to my local used bookstore. I got a ton of credit, and I think for the most part, I picked up all of these classics they are used. And so I just got really lucky. Some days you go in there and you find nothing. Some days you go in and you find everything you could have ever dreamed. And that's just by dint of it being a used bookstore. Uh, it is feast or famine. And this was definitely a feast. So I picked up two Thomas Hardy novels. One was Desperate Remedies, which I have since tried to read in DNF, and I feel so badly about it that I honestly believe it's going to be a permanent DNF. I just genuinely did not like this at all. Uh, hopefully I can get into a better mood, and once I'm in a better mood, and once I'm in more of a Victorian literature mood, I can pick this back up. I feel like Thomas Hardy is more of a springtime read for me than an autumn or winter read. Uh, so maybe if I hold off on this, I will like it better. I also picked up The Well Beloved by Thomas Hardy, and I know nothing about this. I'm going into this one totally and completely blind, uh, but I'm hoping that I have better luck with it than I did with Desperate Remedies. I picked up a lot of poetry. I don't think it's all together, but I did pick up a lot of poetry. One of the things I picked up was something I didn't need, but I picked it up anyway because I am who I am. And so this is the Selected Poems and Prose by Percy Bysshe Shelley, but it's in the Penguin Black Spine edition, okay? I have the Oxford. I needed the Penguin, and there actually is some difference in their lineup. Uh, so Oxford has some things that this edition doesn't have, and this edition has some things that the Oxford doesn't have. At this point, I'm kind of wondering why we don't have a more comprehensive collection or maybe a complete works 
if they had to do it in two different volumes, the complete poetry and then the complete prose, I would be happy with that. But I imagine that there's more prose out there than what I know about. Uh, so this is really exciting and I really, really like this edition. Uh, so now I can have one in a different area or maybe just have one that's kind of my travel Shelly. Uh, so one that I can take with me when I go somewhere and I need to carry Shelly with me. I don't know where that would be. I guess a park maybe, maybe a museum. I feel like Shelly works a little bit better for me out in nature. Uh, so maybe on a walk, I can carry one of these with me. But this was in incredibly good shape uh, and nobody had written in it. I was really thrilled about that. That's one thing I've got to say. It's kind of bad about my local used bookstore. Nine times out of 10, people have annotated the books and I'm talking current literature has been annotated. And that used to not bother me when I wasn't much of an annotator because I thought it was fascinating to see what other people wrote in the margins. But now that I am someone who likes to annotate, I don't like to compete for space with a previous reader, especially one I know nothing about. But uh, the main thing is, I don't think it would bother me as much if the entire book was annotated. But nine times out of 10, people started annotating something and they gave up 20 pages in, or they only annotated a specific poem. This is one that was really exciting to me in just a wide variety of ways. I also picked up Tristram Shandy, if I can say that without getting tongue tied, by Lawrence Stern. And this is a classic from the 18th century that a lot of people have recommended to me. I don't know when I'll get to it because I've heard this is a brick and I've heard it is incredibly hard to get through. Uh, so I don't feel confident about it. I would like to read it one day. So this is kind of on my one day list. Someday I'll read this. This is the awesome, and I mean absolutely awesome, Norton Critical Edition. And if you can get an edition of a classic like this, mm, you will be so happy with it because there are all these appendices where other authors have interacted with the text or criticized it, uh, where other people have uh, reviewed it. And oftentimes it's other classic authors commenting on a kind of contemporary's works and also on somebody who was big generations before them. Uh, so it's really exciting. So Sir Walter Scott had something to say about this, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Samuel Johnson. Uh, so it's just really exciting and I really like these editions. I don't think they're as floppy as I'd like them to be. As you can see, that wants to fight me. I feel like I need to do research into it before I started. I feel like this is a book I need some background on because I believe this is actually one of the first novels written in the English language. And so if you've read it, I would love to know down below if you really enjoyed it and how you suggest going about it. Do you think it should be read over a long period of time or should I just dive in? I picked up the major works by John Donne. John Donne is an English poet from the late 15, early 1600s. And I used to study him quite a bit in school and university. Uh, and I don't know necessarily if I'm gonna like him as much today as I did when I was in college, because in college he absolutely was a break from a lot of the heavier stuff that we were being made to read. Uh, so it was really nice to intersperse heavier studies with John Donne because John Donne was definitely having fun when he was writing poetry. But this edition apparently also includes his sermons, which is fascinating. I apparently know very little about John Donne as a person. Uh, so maybe he's not even who I'm thinking of, but I remember his poetry as being really funny uh, and also being really tongue in cheek and sexy in places. And so maybe I am misremembering, maybe I'm confusing John Donne with somebody else, but I'll have to look through here. It also has his um, letters. That's really exciting. I love these editions of the major works by a person from Oxford World's Classics because they always include more than you think that they would. There's always a bit of poetry, a bit of prose, and sometimes it's got their personal writings like diary entries and letters. Uh, so this is really an exciting find. I'm even more excited about this now. I also picked up Uncle Silas by Jay Sheridan Lefanu, and this was apparently uh, withdrawn from the Johnson County Library from uh, Kansas. Isn't that exciting? Wonder how it wound up over here. But uh, this is a Gothic classic from the Victorian period, and a lot of people have sung its praises this Victober, and I felt like I was missing out. Uh, so I really wanted to pick up a copy of it, and I got really lucky and found one. Uh, so I'm not sure when I'll get to this, because it does feel as though... 
spooky season is ending and so maybe I want to hold off on this until next year this time but maybe not. Uh, a lot of people really like Jay Sheridan Lefanu's writing and I've only read Carmilla by him and that was fine but it was very very short uh, so I'm excited to see what he does with a full-length novel. Speaking of gothic classics I picked up Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin or Maturin I'm not sure how to say his name. This is a romantic classic of gothic fiction that I am really, really intrigued by. And so this is uh, bringing the terrors of the gothic novel to a new pitch of claustrophobic intensity, surpassing the quiet tremors of Anne Radcliffe's romances and its reckless accumulation of cruelties and blasphemies. It's tormented villain, a Faustian transgressor desperately seeking a victim to release him from his fatal bargain with the devil, was regarded by Balzac as one of the great outcasts of modern literature. I think this novel jumps around quite a bit and travels quite a bit. We get to go to a bunch of different countries through this novel and also to different time periods, I believe. This is one I am genuinely excited about, uh, so hopefully I will get to this soon. I also picked up Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. I have DNF this for the time being, but I'm definitely going to come back to it. Uh, this is just one that I feel like I need to be in the right headspace for. I feel like I always need to be in the right headspace if I'm going to try to read a George Eliot novel, and I'm not there right now, so I've just decided to put this down for the time being. But many people have told me this is actually their favorite of George Eliot's. Uh, so that kind of has me really intrigued and really excited to return to this when I'm in the mood. I picked up the Complete Poems and Translations by Christopher Marlowe, and this is one I am just so excited about because I did not know this Penguin Classic existed. I have the Penguin Classic edition of uh, The Complete Plays by Christopher Marlowe, and it's one of my most treasured in my collection of Penguin Classics. I love that book and I'm constantly flipping through it, but I also just really like Christopher Marlowe. Uh, so I'm excited about this to read through his poetry. This has his kind of longer form poem that is, I think his most famous poem actually, which is Hero and Leander, uh, which is a mythological poem that's really, really beautiful. And it also has his translations of Lucan and Ovid, which is really exciting. Ovid and Lucan are two of my favorite classical poets translated by possibly my favorite Elizabethan poet. Uh, so I'm really excited to get into this. This is definitely one I'm going to read here and there, interspersing with other things, but I'm looking forward to picking this one up soon. I found a copy of the portable Edgar Allan Poe, and this is including letters, stories, poetry. This has everything that you could ever dream. Uh, so I think the Portable series in Penguin is very much akin to the Major Works series by Oxford because it often includes people who wrote poetry and prose. So I don't think this is a collected works, a full collected works or anything like that. But I'm really excited to have it uh, because I like Edgar Allan Poe. It's kind of a red flag when somebody says they don't like Edgar Allan Poe. What's not to like? Everything he did was great. But I find that I often forget about him, so I'm glad to have an edition of his works on my shelf. He's not an author that automatically comes to mind for me when I'm thinking of favorites, but whenever anybody mentions him, I'm forced to think about it, and then I remember that I have liked and loved genuinely everything that I've ever read by him. I've not read him to completion, but I have really enjoyed what I've seen from him, and this is the perfect time of year to read Edgar Allan Poe. I think he works well in the fall and I think he works well in the winter as well. Uh, so I'm excited to dig into this and particularly to read what they have to say in the introduction uh, because I think Edgar Allan Poe's life is kind of as fascinating as his work. So this is one I'm really glad I was able to find. I'm really excited to have an edition of Edgar Allan Poe on my shelf. I also picked up The Major Works by Alexander Pope. This is incredible to me because it looks like it wasn't even read. It's just amazing. I do wish it was the floppy Oxford, but I can deal with it. So I love Alexander Pope. I think most people do. Uh, his poetry is really fun to read. It's really beautiful. He's one of the most famous English poets, and I believe he kind of created several styles of poetry that we still have today, which is really interesting. I'm also very curious about Alexander Pope as a person. He, like John Donne, 
I feel like I don't know enough about them as people. Uh, so I'm going to learn a little bit more about both of them before I dive into these collections. I've read quite a bit of Alexander Pope, but at this point I don't know what I read and what I didn't from this collection. So all of it will be brand new to me, I'm sure. Then I picked up Tristan with the Tristan of Thomas by Gottfried von Strasberg, uh, which is a German classic from the medieval period, I believe. Yes, from the medieval period. And it is, of course, about Tristan and Isolde, which is maybe my favorite story from the Arthurian legend. And I love to see it any way that I can. I'll read anything that is a Tristan and Isolde retelling. I really will. So I'm shocked that I didn't really know anything about this and that I've never tried it before. One of my favorite Norse sagas, to go off on a tangent about this, one of my favorite Norse sagas is their retelling of Tristan and Isolde. It is genuinely incredible. It actually might be my second favorite Norse saga. I feel terrible admitting that. A lot of the Norse sagas were actually retelling French classics, which is just fascinating to me. So the one about Tristan and Isolde was one of those where they were transliterating kind of a French classic into Old Norse, which I just think is really, really interesting. And the changes they made and how they told it, just beautiful just absolutely beautiful. I love anything to do with Tristan and Isolde, so I feel confident that I'm probably really going to like this. And I'm currently trying to expand my horizons with German literature. I'm trying to read more German classics and find more German classics, so I was really excited to find this. Something I'm so pumped about, and I can't believe they had at the local used bookstore, is The Lady of the Camellias by Alexander Dumas Feel. Uh, so this is by Alexander Dumas' son but it is the story behind Moulin Rouge, if you have ever seen that film. I don't think I've ever seen it full way through, so I don't really know the story in totality, but so many people have recommended this to me and have said that I'm going to love it. I'm really excited about it. I didn't know it was this short. Uh, so this is one that I'm gonna save for a rainy day because if Alexander Dumas feel is anything like his father, I'm really, really going to love his writing. I also picked up this major works of John Milton, and so this includes Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, all of his shorter poems, which I've never read, and it also includes Samson Agonistes, which is about Samson and Delilah, which is one of my favorite stories from the Bible. It actually might be my favorite uh, Old Testament story is Samson and Delilah. I've heard really good things about that. This is a very comprehensive edition. Let's see where this person was. So they bookmarked this. And this is apparently when Eve eats the fruit. Uh, so a very, very good place to put a page marker. And they were also apparently a fan of Kim Possible. Call me, beat me if you wanna reach me. Me too, I respect it. Uh, so this is one that I'm pumped about. Uh, I have editions of Paradise Lost included with other works elsewhere. Uh, so it seems kind of weird to me to pick up another one where it's included in a collection, but at least this is all about John Milton. And so I'm really dying to reread Paradise Lost. I think it's something that I'm going to do in the new year. And I just really love it. Paradise Lost is one of my all time favorites, but I have never read Paradise Regained or his Samson poem. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to read something else from John Milton. I picked up this absolutely gorgeous edition of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is one of the signature classics from Barnes & Noble and I hope that they come out with at least 20 more of these because they are so beautiful. Uh, they have these French flaps and then on the inside they always have a design so that's her cap, Hester's cap. I, like every other student in America, was forced to read The Scarlet Letter in high school and I hated it so much. I hated it so, so much. But Earlier this year, I read something else by Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Marble Fawn, and that's easily the best book I've read all year, I think. I think I have to say it's my favorite book of the year. It was so beautifully written, and I wonder if I just was not old enough to appreciate The Scarlet Letter. I know why it's assigned, but I don't think I appreciated the themes or the writing of it at the time. So I feel like now I'm ready to give it another shot, knowing that I've read something else by Nathaniel Hawthorne and was just in love with it. I'm shocked at how short it is. It's deceptively short, I'm sure, because the language does require 
quite a bit of you. I don't know what was going on with Nathaniel Hawthorne, but he did really like to write a long sentence. <laughs> His sentences are the size of some paragraphs, but I'm pumped about this. Last but not least, who would I be if a haul did not include an Italian classic? I can't believe there's only one in this haul, but this is The Prince and Other Writings by Niccolò Machiavelli. I have been looking for an edition of this for a long time that would be portable uh, and easy to keep around. I have an e-version of this, but I really wanted a physical copy, and I also wanted one that included his other writings. So uh, this includes The Prince, of course, which is his most famous work, but it also includes The Life of Castellano. Struccio Castracani, uh, which was the basis of Mary Shelley's historical novel Valperga, and I really loved that last year, one of my favorite books of the year, and so I'm excited to see what she read for research for it. Uh, it also includes his letters, actually one of his letters apparently, a very long letter, from Niccolò Machiavelli to Francesco Vittori. wonder who he was. Uh, and it also includes excerpts from his discourses on the first ten books of Livy. Uh, so I wish it was everything, but I'll take excerpts. If I need a full edition of that, I can worry about that when the time comes. But I'm interested to see what he has to say about Livy. I think The Prince is one of the most fascinating books ever written, and I think everyone should read it once. And there are not many books that I think should be on a curriculum or should be studied. I think The Prince should be studied at the college level by everyone. Uh, it is just genuinely fascinating. No matter what your political leanings, what your political background, it is just a really interesting read. And it's interesting because I think it sparks a lot of discussion, which is why I think it should be studied. You should be around other people when you read The Prince because it is so uh, really thought provoking. And I think you want others to bounce those thoughts off of. This is a really fascinating work. Uh, so I'm looking forward to rereading this and then reading everything else in this collection. So that was my most recent book haul. Hopefully you won't see another one from me until the end of the year. You're probably seeing this in November, and so it is almost the end of the year now. Uh, so it's kind of sad, but hopefully I'm just going to make a resolution to myself that I'm not going to let the pile get this big uh, before I share the books with you. But that's going to be all for me today. I would love to know if you have read any of these. I would love to know if you have been hauling anything interesting lately, but that's going to be all for me today. So I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.